Welcome to Speak Your Mind by Climobilize. My guest for this session is Sasha Beslik. Sasha has been a pioneer in sustainable investing for over two decades, and he is currently the Chief Investment Officer of SDG Impact Japan. Sasha, it's great to have you with us today. Brad, thank you very much for inviting me. Pleasure to be here. Uh, in this session, Sasha will be speaking about why has declaring climate emergencies mostly failed to create meaningful change? So let's start right there, Sasha. Why are climate emergencies and declaring climate emergencies not achieving the desired goal? Uh, it's not re <laughs> receiving a desired goal be because we are running an economic system that is based on a completely different incentive models. Uh, it has the structure of the system. The market economy that we run across the world is based on premises that are completely, um, I would say, detached from physical reality that we are living in, including the climate emergency that is hitting uh, across the world. Uh, Given that the incentive models, uh, the structure, the, the laws and regulations related to fidu interpretation of fiduciary duty of people working, for instance, in a financial industry is interpreted in a completely different way. Uh, we have a situation where the climate emergency is hitting record after record in terms of impacting physical and transitional sort of lives of people around the world. And in the same time, we have economic model that is still based on, on uh, limitless growth. These two things, of course, it has been debated over many years. Can they uh, can they work together? Uh, yes, in, in the case they are decoupled from, from dependency on the fossil fuels, which is the fact uh, still not the case in the world. We are 80% still dependent on fossil fuel energy around the world, and our investments in renewable energy and other sources of energy is not really up to the scale where they, they should be. So in, in short, no. The system that we run is not built for it. So... Uh, it works for other reasons, but it's not really built for this. So we're working with a system that is not designed to solve the challenge we have. So you might say that there's no surprise that we're not really making any progress. Um, we talked a little about the 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 essence of capitalism um, and how it aims to create market failure uh, and how the system itself works to maintain that failure. Could you could you sh uh, shed some light on that, please? Sure. I mean, look, the, the, there is a, it's been a long sort of a well-known fact in the economic world and in the financial industry in general that we are not uh, paying for externalities that we are impacting through our investment decisions and investments we are making. And the fact is that these externalities are outsourced to the public and covered for by uh, tax uh, taxpayers around the world, uh, the entire sort of a mechanism works on outsourcing the risk, uh, EA cost, uh, to somebody else and privatizing the profits, socializing the cost. And that's the sort of a how we have built the system. And the system, as I said earlier, it's supported by laws and regulation, which is making it very difficult for, let's say, yeah, a lot of people around the world, they think, yeah, we can you know, change the way that the climate emerges the consequence of non-functioning systems. So we're already always trying to find a way how to, to change the consequence. Let's do a CCS technology. Let's do a new technical innovation. But nobody's actually questioning the underlying problem, the problem that system itself has created, which is that externalities are not, not priced. They are not accounted for. Uh, they are outsourced and uh, the, the profits are, are privatized. And that's the, basically the game we are running. And there is no change, systemic change, that we believe, uh, you know, in, in my industry, I'm, I'm talking to companies every day. I'm investing in a mid-sized companies in Japan. I'm talking to the management in these companies. <clears throat> the problem they are facing is the fact that they are not changing underlying business model. They are still based on growth. And if you look at the way how they develop, even though they are trying to solve some of the scope one, two, and three emissions, on the end of the story, what we are facing is that these companies, as they grow, their emissions are growing. And that's basically the fact of the, of the reality we are facing. And I think people are sometimes thinking that, you know, the individual actions or the actions by, you know, um, the, the, the different sort of stakeholders around the world, including the UN, will change the things. I, I, I'm sorry to say that, but 
if you look at the way how we are still sort of constructing and running our economies around the world, especially, I mean, market sort of a liberal economies, it's all, it's, it will be almost impossible to do that because the underlying business models that need to change their products, production of these products, distribution of these products, and so on, are actually not changing. And this is the core sort of a challenge <clears throat> that very few people would like to discuss in, in public. And I mean, in the boardrooms and in, in the business meetings, in the financial and advisory meetings, these things are usually not mentioned. So you spend a lot of time in those um, financial type meetings. Um, what's the appetite for corporations to um, spend more to fix a problem that is global in nature uh, and doesn't have a positive um, financial reward for the company itself? For example, um, trying to combat uh, plastic pollution or um, carbon pollution. Um, how do those conversations go when you say we might have to spend more to achieve that outcome, and I don't see any foreseeable way to um, increase profitability from that effort. I think we need to start with the, with the first things first, and that is that all of the sustainability efforts that most of the companies around the world are doing are on the sort of a group level, the value level of the companies. What, can, what values does Sasha have, and how does Sasha report its values, and then I'm ranked on that. Very few companies have shifted their sustainability efforts to their products and services, actually where the core business is. And this is the reason why these conversations very often uh, end up in the fact that when we look at the company's financial growth projection, we look at their sustainability targets and we ask them, what's the connection between these two? They usually look like a question mark because they don't understand why do they need to be connected? And this is the core reason why discussions are in relation to let's take out the product range that has significant impact on let's say pollution plastic pollution or any kind of chemical pollution there is no ceo that will do that and uh, there is no pension company in the world that will take a hit and say we're gonna act, we're gonna divest from this industry because we don't believe this fits with what we want to achieve you know in a 20 30 years time and the politicians of course don't want to lose the voters because you know if the pension company or uh, a company uh, that is uh, losing uh, the money on the market, being punished by the market because it's taking out the product range that is environmentally unsustainable, that CEO will most likely get kicked out uh, two months later and replaced by somebody else that will continue to grow the business with the existing products, maybe paying a couple of fees or punishments for products being unsustainable but still running the model as it is because the corporate charter of the companies used in, 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 in the Western world and used in all over the market liberal economies does not stipulate the personal responsibility of the CEOs and the boards for potential environmental and sustainability damage that products and services can create. Unless we change the underlying corporate charters, the regulation that's, that basically um, defines the role and responsibilities of people managing these companies there will be no uh, addressing the climate emergency. Of course, everybody will like. Uh, everybody is is talking about it. It's it's mentioned in the boardrooms. It's mentioned in the meetings. But what it means in the real terms, it's not addressed. No. So if we have a uh, a corporate system, an economic system that incentivizes uh, cost cutting. Um, external, externalizing harm, um, and that's where the rewards come from and the incentives. And then we have uh, policymakers who are afraid to push towards something that the public is mostly confused about uh, because messaging is uh, so confusing. Um, where does the transformation begin to reconfigure the system? Where do you see the, the 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 weakness that we can push towards making that sort of uh, assault on this broken system? I think one of the challenges that I face is that we often talk about the consequences of climate change. You know, I recently read a number of these articles saying that in, in, in media, sort of a world, global media, saying that we will have to adjust. We have to, th these are the 10 ways how you can adjust to the heat or the cold. 
uh, these are the things we can sort of adjust to in terms of the climate uh, emergency that is creating these kind of changes. Nobody's actually talking about how can we sort of gear or change the underlying model that will then result in a systemic change. Educational system is one of them. I mean, look, we are we are still educating uh, billions and millions of people around the world along the line of the curriculum that is educating them, especially in economics and the finance, in a way that is completely disconnected with the world they are, these young people are facing when they're starting to work. And they actually lack the tool. And if you are programming that way, when you go through the educational system, you come out, and then you are supposed to do environmental impact assessment or social impact assessment of the business, uh, but you have been told that this is externalities, you don't need to focus on that because that's taken care of by politicians and taxpayers. Uh, of course, your incentive models are looking completely different. So the, the politicians and the way how the uh, we have a liberal totalitarian regimes as well, because they are totalitarian in a way that we have one solution for the problems that are so polarized and so, uh, I would say, diverse and, and the capitalistic system as it is, it's actually working on the premises of the laws and regulations that stipulate how it operates. We can't change the system. We don't change the laws and regulations and the incentive models below. That includes educational system. That includes the way how we, uh, how we actually talk and what are the things that we need to address. We don't need to address the CO2 emissions. Let's look at something else. Let, what creates CO2 emissions? What are the incentives behind the CO2 emissions? What are the growth projections? What are the financial models? All of these things are not in a debate. And I think many of the people in the industry are actually quite happy with that because they don't need to deal with the real issue. The real issue is technology will solve it. The real issue is everybody will drive electrical vehicle. The real issue is that we will go over to organic food. Uh, you know, these are the sort of symbolic solutions, but in a, in a, in a bottom sort of, a, of these solutions, there is a underlying sort of a challenge that nobody wants to actually talk about. I like the... Uh... The way you framed it as a as a symbolic solution, we got plenty of those, um, and yeah. we see how far those get us. Um, the 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 solution is to ask um, corporations to take their eye off of of capital accumulation and corporate profits, um, but that's how they are rewarded. And nobody's telling them that the system is going to shift how rewards are uh, achieved in the system. Um, so if you could tweak the system and you could say, okay, I'm not going to change too much of the system. I don't want to burn the system down because that's going to create chaos. But I want to tweak it and I want to incentivize more um, well-being. So... Tesla doesn't fight against unions or Walmart doesn't fight against unions. What kind of simple changes would you make on a policy level to ensure that corporations had to maximize well-being uh, as a way to get those increased uh, rewards? Um, you know, I think it's a very good question. And I've been thinking about it a lot. And of course, you have different entry points into this. You can think about you know, uh, the, the, you can you can use a taxation system to tax them less if they are performing in a certain way. You can use, uh, you know, different kinds of incentives. <clears throat> but I believe this is my personal belief. And, and, and I think that will be the, the fastest way is to actually change the, the, the corporate charters and uh, specify, define accountability on a personal level for the people at the board level and the CEO. Uh, I'm a strong uh, proponent of that because I think it is, this is about people. People make decisions. You have, uh, I'm making reference to a, a very famous uh, philosopher who wrote the book uh, about a completely different topic called the, the, the Banal Evil, Hannah Arndt. Uh, she wrote that book after Eichmann, uh, sort of a trial in Israel. Uh, when you read that book and you, when you actually try to sort of do some of the references into the, the world we live in, there are so many similarities because, you know, when you talk to these people, they will just usually tell you that we are just doing what we are told to do. You know, these are the, these are the rules of engagement. This is what we do. And, uh, you know, we are just doing our job. And uh, mm -hmm. that's how they see it. And they go home and they play with their kids and, mm -hmm. you know, they buy an electrical vehicle and uh, they tell all their friends that they are recycling at home and, you know, 
it's all done, but then they go to work and they make decision to make 20 billion investments into extraction of oil and gas in the Northern Sea. And because it's not, it has nothing to do with morals, it just has to do with this is what they are supposed to do. And they're very excellent in that. They're doing that very good. So mm-hmm. this is what, this is where the trouble is, you know, how mm-hmm. in the interpretation of, of this role that you have. When you're executive and you want to make things happen, uh, and you have seen it around the world, I mean, there have been drop-offs from BlackRock and from some other uh, banks and also companies, people walking out in the UK, in the government, people walking out because they don't, they can actually not just do their job because they feel what they are told to do is not good. Uh, so it starts some kind of a, with a, you know, personal courage, but it also starts going back to the educational system. We need really to take care, take care of young generation. If we don't, we're not going to be able to change anything. Yeah. No, I, I've also not heard it compared to that book, The Banality of Evil. It's 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 such an interesting comparison. Um, so as we come to the end here, um, are there any thoughts or, or lessons or ideas that you'd like to share with the audience uh, uh, as a final thought? Look, I think, you know, from my sort of a professional experience, I'm investing in mid-cap companies, mid-segment of the companies, not big companies, smaller companies that I believe are more nimble, more easy to change the business model. I think the future is more, it's the future is not a large future. It's more regional sort of, a, you know, mid-sized future uh, with a lot of regional cooperation, a lot of new business models. Uh, I don't believe that the, the current model where we are run by 10 IT tech companies will actually help us to solve what we need to solve. I think people need to start to shift the the way they think about this. I think many people are doing, but we have plenty of work in front of us. Yeah, I often think about the uh, the artificial uh, lines on the map of our uh, geopolitical borders as being completely inconsistent with the challenges that should be drawn around ecosystems. Yes, we have an ecosystem problem in the Amazon. And it's spread amongst many countries. So those are the yes. countries that need to address the issue. Um, and then you have the uh, Arctic that has issues. And you need to have a, a, a solution there. And then there's climate change around the whole planet where everybody has to be involved. Yeah. Um, Sasha, thanks so much for sharing your thoughts uh, with us today. Thanks thanks, um, thanks for having me. And, and uh, it was a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Brad. And I want to wish you good luck, good health. And let's hope that we can make... Uh, a positive impact this year. We got a new year to begin with and um, let's, uh, let's do our best. Thanks again. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Bye.